Please start uh, taking a seat. If you can get one, more seats are going up in the back. Now we're going to get ready to start in a minute or two. Good evening, everyone. How's everyone doing tonight? It is our big pleasure, our great honor to welcome you tonight to this very important celebration of one of the most historic moments in our continent and for working and struggling people everywhere. I don't know how many of you heard the State of the Union some people said that socialism will be impossible or will never happen in the United States. But we know it actually will be possible. And we know it for a fact 
because Cuba exists today. We are not here simply to talk about the past or to celebrate the heroes of the past, but to actually talk about this island in the sea of capitalism and disorder that gives us hope, that gives us the energy to continue resisting, not just against Trump, but against all the powers that take away the dignity of our people. We are honored to have our dear ambassador here. Even though we are letting her go, we are happy to know that there is going to be a continuing strong representation of the Cuban people at the UN. We were so proudly seeing you how you defended Venezuela in the Security Council. And that was simply another reminder of the importance of Cuba for us today. Again, we talk about the Cuba that is there, not just for Venezuela, but for all people who are struggling for peace and justice in the planet. We talk about the Cuba that stands with poor and working people, with dispossessed people in this country. We talk about the Cuba that still extends asylum to our dear freedom fighters. We talk about the Cuba that still stands strong, offering medical scholarships to our young people when no one else would. And we're here ultimately because there were 12 men in the Sierra Maestra who believed in the impossible too. We are here because of their dreams. And we open this night precisely with this opening, this calling to continue dreaming. Not just dreaming lawfully with our eyes closed, but dreaming with our eyes open like Fidel would have. Dreaming for a better planet, only possible under socialism. We welcome you to the People's Forum. This is a home for organizers and activists and for all those who dare to dream together. This is also a home for Cuba. We will never hide the fact that we support and love the Cuban Revolution. And we stand with you tonight <laughs> to welcome all the folks who have come here to celebrate. And with that, I want to ask Ike Nahum of the New York, New Jersey Cuba Sea Coalition to share with us the rest of the program for the evening. Thank you, Manolo. We're so excited to have our first, and I'm certain it's not going to be our last, solidarity event for Cuba and the Cuban Revolution at this beautiful new space in, uh, in middle of Manhattan. So I'd like to just ask everybody to give an applause to the wonderful staff at the People's Forum that has helped us so much. On behalf of the New York, New Jersey, Cuba Sea Coalition, I want to thank everyone for coming out tonight for this evening of celebration and solidarity, marking the 60th anniversary of the triumph of the living Cuban Revolution. Because it is a living revolution, not a relic of heroic old history, which we are celebrating tonight. After 60 momentous years, the Cuban Revolution continues to be a beacon for the oppressed and exploited overwhelming majority of humanity. The Cuban Socialist Revolution has had an indelible impact on history, way out of proportion to the island's size, its economic weight, or its military power. Although I wouldn't recommend that anybody mess with its, uh, with its military power. This enduring political impact of the Cuban Revolution in the world of today is because of the power of the revolution's socialist, internationalist, humane, and ethical ideas, principles, and practice. This is the living legacy of Fidel and the teams of outstanding revolutionary leaders, women and men, at the head of a fighting people that was forged under his leadership. The accomplishments of the Cuban Revolution in the teeth of the most ferocious and unremitting pressure, opposition and pressure from Washington, bipartisan Washington, are immense. And we cite them as an example of how a better world for working people 
for the overwhelming majority of humanity is possible. We cite the amazing conquests of, of uh, access to free and equal health care with stunning and irrefutable results, which of course, as Manola mentioned, Cuba shares with the world through its medical internationalism. The amazing story, the same is true with education. The amazing story of Cuban women and their elevation under the policies and programs ushered in with the Cuban Revolution. The tremendous blows dealt to Cuban-style Jim Crow, racism and segregation. The more recent, after initial limits and mistakes, decisive advances in LGBTQ rights. We should also highlight the mass participation through democratic procedures, self-organization and debate of the sovereign Cuban people in determining the course of their lives. We are seeing in practice the marvelous fruits of this legacy of mass participation, of participatory democracy in the organized and mass process leading to the creation and ratification of a new constitution for Cuba. Over the past years, we have seen the passing of the revolutionary torch to a new generation in full political and revolutionary continuity with the generation of the his his historicos. Our sister and compañera, Ambassador Anayance Rodriguez, is a wonderful example of this process, along with so many of the sisters and brothers at the Cuban mission whose trench in the struggle is at the UN defending their nation's sovereignty and Cuba's revolutionary foreign policy. Tomorrow, our sister is leaving for her new post as Deputy Foreign Minister of Cuba. And tonight, we want <laughs> And tonight, we want to express our great appreciation for the years we have worked together and our best wishes and abrazos in your future work. And we expect we will be seeing you again uh, here in New York City and in Cuba as well. It is, it is precisely because the Cuban Revolution is a living, resonant revolution that the United States government has sought to destroy it by any means possible and thereby to eradicate once and for all the historical, social, moral, and political example of revolutionary and socialist Cuba, particularly across the Americas, but all over the world, including inside the United States. Under President Barack Obama in the second half of his second term, there was an important U.S. shift and retreat. The remaining Cuban five incarcerated heroes were released, and Cuba was removed from the notorious terrorist nations list, leading to the restoration of formal diplomatic relations. The Donald Trump White House has been trying to roll back and reverse these limited measures while attempting to tighten and enhance the U.S. blockade, which had remained in place under Obama and which can only be repealed by an act of Congress signed into law by a president. We are here tonight to say there have always been supporters of the Cuban Revolution in the United States, and our ranks are growing. Last September 26, 2,500 of us filled the historic Riverside Church to welcome Cuba's Miguel Diaz Canal. There was not a word of that in the New York Times or in any cable news network that I saw. 2,500 people in New York City to welcome and embrace the president of Cuba and not a word in the media. Furthermore, our message of ending the economic blockade ending all travel sanctions and ending all regime change programs against Cuba, that is for the normalization of relations, that is a position of a clear majority of the people of the United States. Today, tonight we have, I would like to point out some of our special guests. To begin with, I would like to uh, welcome the entire large, maybe 50 people from the Cuban mission to the United States nations that are here. And in particular, in addition to the ambassador who will be introduced later in the program, I would like to also welcome uh, Ambassador Ana Silvia Rodriguez, who's the Deputy Permanent 
uh, ambassador, representative of Cuba to the United Nations. I would like to recognize the representatives that are here from Casa de las Americas, Cuba's, uh, Cuban Americans whose roots go back to support for the Cuban Revolution before it triumphed here in New York City and the East Coast. I'd like to recognize a lot of the, the political organizations that despite whatever political differences they have, have generally worked together in a spirit of unity in defense of our beloved Cuba. That Communist Party, the Communist Workers League, Frente Socialista of Puerto Rico, the Puerto Rican Nationalist Party, Fuerza de la Revolución, People's Organization for Progress, Party of Socialism and Liberation, Socialist Action, Socialist Workers Party, United Zulu Nation, Workers World Party, Pro Libertad and organizations from the Haitian organizations and uh, Puerto Rican organizations and many organizations uh, that have united and worked uh, in solidarity with Cuba over the years. I'm sorry we were unable to hear tonight all the solidarity messages that have been coming in uh, and uh, from these and other organizations. But we will, to, to Cuba C, but we will produce, reproduce, and collate all of them into a package and any group that or representatives that want to send a, uh, uh, an email uh, that gives your uh, position or a statement and we will uh, collate them into an attractive package and present them to the uh, folks at the um, Cuban Mission to the United States. Now I want to say, close with a word about Venezuela. We celebrate tonight while the Donald Trump White House with the largely solid support of Democratic Party elected officials, is trying to organize and expedite a military coup in Venezuela. Trump and his arrogant crew of Pence, Pompeo, Bolton, and the dusted off war criminal Elliot Abrams are working hard under a smokescreen of disingenuous and deceitful propaganda to create the political and logistical conditions for direct U.S. military intervention in the service of a military coup. And we know they are also targeting Cuba. Propaganda, however, is in and of itself never enough. It may be it's dawning, it seems to be, on a, on a number of big business politicians and media mouthpieces for the ruling class that the Venezuela working class and its allies, devastated by the economic crisis, will nevertheless fight to defend its national sovereignty and the self-determination of their land, the land of Simon Bolivar. I think the U.S. rulers worry that the law of unintended consequences will come into play. Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro has accurately pointed out that if Washington's course will face them with another Vietnam in Central America. So we are also tonight politically vigilant, and we say along with Cuba si bloqueo no, U.S. hands off Venezuela. <laughs> the Cuban Revolution burst into the world scene 60 years ago when the revolutionary armies of the July 26th movement, commanded overall by Fidel, seized power in Havana on January 1st, 1959. The hated U.S.-backed Batista regime collapsed after the decisive battle of Santa Clara under the command of Ernesto Che Guevara. These victorious revolutionaries, like the slaves under Spartacus, like the Paris communards, they truly stormed the heavens. These young fighters, men and women, mostly workers and peasants of all races, national origins and skin colors, dissolved the institutions of the weak, neo-colonial Cuban capitalist state. That is, they broke up its neo-colonial army, its vicious cops, its courts, its rigged criminal justice system, and build a new workers and peasants state power. Based on the class interests, the direct part mass participation, and the social and legal dominance of working people. Many of us doing this fulfilling and dedicated work of Cuba Solidarity here in New York and New Jersey have had our commitment forged by our education and consciousness about the decisive part of Cuba under the brilliant political, military, and diplomatic leadership of our beloved brother Fidel in the battle to defend the sovereignty of Angola, to win the independence of Namibia, 
and to facilitate the mass actions of the South African people and masses in the unraveling and defeat of the apartheid state. And we will never forget it. <laughs> to our Cuban sisters and brothers here tonight, we have together gone through many struggles, and we have forged unbreakable ties of friendship and solidarity. We fought together to return Elian Gonzalez to his Cuban father and family. And we won that fight. For many painful years, we fought to free the Cuban Five, Antonio, Fernando, Gerardo, Ramon, and Rene. We thank you for your example and for your solidarity. We thank you for giving working class North Americans the opportunity to become doctors at Elam. We pledge our solidarity forever. Hasta la victoria siempre, Cuba si bloqueo no. Thank you. Okay, now we're going to come back to the present and actually a little bit into the future. The next, we're going to have three short presentations from the uh, three representatives of the three brigades that are going to Cuba in the next period to break the blockade, to organize people, to travel to Cuba. They have material here. We have representatives in chronological order of the May Day International Brigade, the IFCO car uh, Caravan, and the um, Venceremos Brigade 50th Anniversary Special Brigade. Let's hear it for the 50th anniversary of the Benza Ramos Brigade. So let's start with the uh, representative from the May Day International Brigade. Paul Mayot. Thank you, Ike. Um, we're going to hear a lot about the Cuban Revolution tonight. And uh, one of the, mic, louder, mic, higher. Okay. Before here. Is that good? Is that better? Okay. Uh, I was saying we're going to hear a lot about the Cuban Revolution tonight, but uh, one of the best ways to learn about the Cuban Revolution is to go and see it for yourself. And uh, we all have opportunity with three different trips coming up in before the end of this year to go to Cuba. Uh, what I would like to invite you all to and, and tell you a little bit about is the International May Day Brigade to Cuba, April 21st through May 5th of this year. This is a brigade that takes place around the annual May 1st march in Havana where hundreds of thousands of Cuban workers turn out to show their support for Cuba's socialist revolution and show their determination to defend it. It's a demonstration of Cuba's fighting people who have stood up to US political, economic, and military intervention under Democratic and Republican administrations since 1959 for some 60 years. The May Day Brigade is sponsored by the Cuban Institute for Friendship with the Peoples, and in the U.S. is organized, the U.S. contingent is organized by the National Network on Cuba. I was on the brigade in 2017 and will be on it again this year. I want to just say a couple things, just if we only have a couple minutes, each of us here, but w while you're on this brigade, you're working alongside and learning from Cuban workers and farmers, meeting students, meeting with representatives of mass organizations, and interacting with Cubans in their neighborhoods and community organizations. They are eager to talk to us when we're there, and they are also eager to know what we think, what we are doing in the United States and other countries where we come from to, to to carry out political activity and change the world like they did with the Cuban Revolution. In the camp where you're staying, which is rustic but uh, accommodating, 
uh, for brigade members of all ages. We had brigade members who were as old as 85 and as young as 11 in 2017. Uh, you're, you're housed with people from many countries. There, there are 22 countries represented at, at, in the 2017 brigade, and we had a contingent of 70 from the United States. Uh, you learn from them, and they, they learn also from you, and uh, you go through an experience there that uh, you, you don't get in any other kind of trip to Cuba, I think, uh, in terms of just a broad outreach and working together with revolutionaries and also people that don't know much about Cuba and are coming to learn, which, which is really what we want to have on all of these brigades. And of course, when you come back, you can do something about what you learned, uh, which is, is probably the most important thing about the Cuba brigades. That is, we're, we're not just going as tourists to learn, to, to be part of uh, what's going on there, but we're, we're coming back to reinforce the struggles that we're all involved in, uh, in, in the United States and other countries around the world. Just uh, lastly, the trip to Cuba on the May Day Brigade is uh, inexpensive. It's uh, 650 plus your airfare. The deadline for signing up is March 15th, and uh, uh, all your money has to be in by March 22nd, so please act soon, and applications are at the table in the back. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, and then somebody we have from the IFCO Caravan, which is Gail Walker, the director of IFCO Pastors for Peace. I don't want to move the mic, but I'm a little short. So, um, thank you. Good evening. Good evening, Ambassador. Good evening, all of our friends. Um, this is an exciting evening, and I look forward to not throwing my glasses away. <laughs> that wasn't the plan. Um, but to... To, to talking more uh, with you and about you later. But very quickly, um, are we excited? Are we excited to be here? I mean, I don't know. I'm just feeling like I need a little bit of energy in the room, right? All right. This is a celebration, people. We are celebrating the 60th anniversary of the Cuban Revolution. We're celebrating our dear um, sister ambassador. Um, so this is a celebratory moment. And I guess I want us to feel enthused and excited. But very quickly. Um, I just wanted to talk briefly about the upcoming French Shipment Caravan. Many of you know that since 1992, IFCO Pastors for Peace has been organizing caravans, French Shipment Caravans to Cuba uh, as a way to deliver humanitarian aid, but perhaps more importantly, to have people from the U.S. travel to Cuba to see it firsthand. To travel to see it firsthand and to, to really push back against the uh, massive uh, misinformation campaign that is so prevalent in this country toward Cuba. Uh, we do this intentionally without seeking, without asking for or accepting U.S. government permission to do so. Right? Thank you. That, thank you, Rachel. Yeah. That's a very important element. That's a very important uh, piece of the work because the U.S. government has tried to really dictate where we go, how we go, what we do while we're there. They really have tried to, um, to control the narrative about Cuba. And so the idea of going without uh, asking for permission, without uh, requiring um, uh, you know, the, uh, a government license is very much at the, the root of the caravan projects that have been um, going down to C Cuba since 1992. This summer, we'll be uh, organizing our 30th, our 30th Friendship McCaravan, and we will be traveling to uh, um, Havana and also to the uh, province of Cienfuegos. Um, we're looking forward to um, really a, an exciting uh, program. Just came back from Cuba, and we've just begun really um, looking at the, the various ways that we want to make sure that people have a very memorable experience in Cuba. But the point is, no matter how you do it, everybody ought to go to Cuba. How many of us have been to Cuba? Okay, this is good, that's good. How many have not been there yet? Okay, now I wanna talk to you. 
All right, you would have you the people they need to talk to, right? There's 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 a variety of different ways that you can go. You've you've heard about the Great May Day um, Brigade, which is a wonderful uh, experience. I encourage those who can to travel uh, with that brigade. Those who have never had the experience of being a brigadista of, uh, on a Vince Ramos Brigade, what? This is a, a 50th anniversary. Uh, once in a lifetime opportunity that's another way you can go and of course you can always go travel with us uh, on the the caravans life-changing people it's a life-changing experience and I encourage you to check out the tables on the side collect information um, I'm here to talk I know that there's several people in the room who have been on uh, previous uh, caravans but the point is we want you to uh, explore the different ways that you can travel to Cuba see it for yourself and uh, then return home and get to work. That's the plan, right? So that's, uh, that's the gist. But thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank, thank you, Gail. And uh, Gail will be coming up again in a couple of minutes to help introduce uh, our special guest. Uh, so the last report we want to hear is somebody from Vence Ramos Brigade, Rachel, Rachel Ibrahim. Welcome, sister. Good evening, everybody. How you doing? Yeah, give me some energy, y'all. Come on now. How y'all feeling? Yeah. Thanks to Gail, you warmed me up, all right? Thank you, thank you. How many of you have been on the Vincent Amos Brigade? Let me see you. I see all 10 of us. Yes, 15, maybe. Yes, beautiful. Thank you. Um, I want to start by saying thank you to you. Um, because of the people who started this as, you know, when we think about the oldest Cuba Solidarity Collective in existence, because of the people like you who went on the brigade, started in 1969, because of you we are still doing this today. Because of you and the hard work you've done, we continue to go in civil disobedience. We continue to not ask for a license. Um, we believe it is our constitutional right to travel. And so we will continue to do so. This is 50 years of solidarity, 50 years um, in our um, um, anniversary contingent. And so that means we're going to go big. <laughs> we're going big. And that means we're going to take 300 people this summer Woo! to Cuba. <laughs> Within about one month of our application being live, uh, we already are a third of the way there. We have 100 applicants currently. That means only 200 more. We can do that. No problem, right? With your help, we can do that. And um, this year, you know, every year is special. Every year is important. And this year, we want to expose 300 people through civil disobedience and traveling to Cuba with the brigade, knowing that this is an opportunity for us to actually live and practice another world. What does it mean for us actually to embody the values of equity? What does it mean for us to actually be in an environment that could nurture us to actually live in a different way? And so we are excited um, to offer three trips with the brigade actually this summer. And so it's uh, one group, three trip options. And so we are all going to be going for three weeks in July and August. There will be an option for 10 days, for two weeks, and for three weeks for those of you who want to go from, e uh, from west to east and completely travel across the country. Um, there's going to be a fourth option, which is new for us uh, this year, which is we're going to offer a licensed option for people who otherwise are um, um, uh, prohibited from going on the brigade because we do civil disobedience. And so that licensed option is going to be offered to people who are formerly incarcerated, people who maybe have disabilities or folks who are elders who need another um, alternative. And so that will be a smaller group of folks who will be traveling with us this year. Um, otherwise, the three trip options, like I said, will travel from uh, west to east. The first group will be mostly in the west, in Havana, and for day trips around. Um, the uh, two-week um, two trip will travel uh, to mostly, actually, all the way to the, to the east, um, to Camagüey. And then um, uh, the third trip will go all the way to Santiago. Um, we also, uh, the, the history of the brigade is that we do solidarity work. We do work side by, um, side, by side with folks and learn more about uh, different aspects of Cuban life. Um, and so that will be an important element of our trip. Um, we will, similar to other, um, others who've spoken before me, that we will also be doing, um, um, just learning as much as possible about every aspect of Cuban society and being able to actually build relationships with the Cuban people. Um, the trips range in cost from 1700 to 2000 300 that does not include the flight to a third country and we also are working hard to fundraise to make sure that we can offset the cost specifically for activists for black and brown folks for queer folks for trans folks for gender nonconforming people 
um, to make sure that everyone has access to this trip. Um, so scholarships will be available. Um, the last thing that I'll say is uh, we really want to not only ask you to join us, but if you're not able to join us, please support the work. Uh, that could look like donations. We are not an organization. We are a volunteers, a work project that has existed for 50 years. We need any funding that we can get, and so we are going to have um, this information. We'll be sitting over there by our T-shirts that are also for sale, um, how you can either leave cash donations or send a check um, to our fiscal sponsor. Um, the last thing is feel free to buy a T-shirt, and, um, and please follow us on um, social media, VB for Cuba. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rachel. Okay, in a couple of minutes, we're going to bring on our special, special guest, uh, the ambassador, the outgoing ambassador. Uh, but as part of introducing her, I would like to call on um, a couple of other special guests that we have, one of whom you already just saw, but is going to come up again. But first, I'd like to bring up Judy uh, Sheridan Gonzalez, who is the president of the New York State Nurses Association. I I, who have sent many delegations of nurses and other health workers to Cuba. And I understand that Judy wrenched herself away from pretty hard negotiations with the medical bosses in the area. So I'm sure you'll be happy to be here among, uh, among your brothers and sisters. So Judy. It's such an honor to be here with people who have uh, who share a common viewpoint that's very important. As you know, many of our, our population is subjected to the propaganda, not only against Cuba, but against Venezuela, um, and that's a big challenge for us. In our organization, um, we did have many nurses. We do have many nurses who are also very confused about what's going on in the world, and we can talk to them, and we can offer literature, and we can offer stories, but there's nothing like going to uh, the other country and seeing a healthcare system that spends one hundredth of what we spend here and yet provides a higher quality of care to the people in the nation. And that has been a, a life changing experience for our members, and we're really happy about that. <laughs> Un unfortunately, it's not only about going to Cuba, it's about dealing with the situation here in this country and what the capitalists are doing to our population and trying to throw them off guard. Uh, we are looking very soon, perhaps, to a strike of 15,000 nurses in the city of New York, uh, <laughs> fighting a very f big fight against corporate control of health care, uh, for a single-payer system, for safe staffing for our patients, for equality of care, not just quality of care, where we have a health care system that treats one set of people, poor people, people of color, people without papers in one way, and very wealthy people in another way. And that's, we're committed to fight against that as we are also committed to uh, going to the United Nations and testifying about the health impact. My distinct pleasure to be here to, uh, to introduce our honored guest this evening. Ambassador Anayansi Rodriguez Camejo has served as Cuba's permanent representative to the United Nations for the past two years. It's gone by very quickly. Uh, the ambassador is truly a rising star um, she's graduated from, with a bachelor's degree in international economic relations from the Raul, Ra, let me get this straight, Raul Roa Garcia Higher Institute of International Relations in Havana, Cuba. She studied international relations and development at the International Institute of Social Studies at The Hague in the Netherlands. And between 2013 and 2016, she served as Cuban ambassador to the United Nations office at Geneva and to other international organizations based in Switzerland. And during her tenure as UN ambassador, she has taken on some of the most challenging tasks uh, due to the hostility of the Trump administration and the aggressive attacks of the US delegation at the United Nations. Among her memorable duties has been playing a leadership role during the annual UN vote to condemn the US uh, commercial and economic blockade of Cuba. And who can forget the righteous and raucous protest, right? You know I'm getting ready to talk about it. The, ra the raucous protest that the ambassador and other diplomats uh, held at the United Nations Economic and Social Council last fall when the US delegation attempted to wage a slanderous attack on Cuba's alleged human rights abuses. 
And those of you who were there or who, witnessed, who got a chance to see the video, uh, we were so proud of our, our, our friends, our Cuban friends. But the U.S. government's aggression has not only been directed at Cuba. As was stated uh, earlier, other nations have come under attack due to the principles that they hold and positions and policies that often stand in direct contrast to the U.S. empire's long-standing goal of global domination. Iran, Iraq, North Korea, the list goes on and on and on, and of course, most recently, Venezuela. But Cuba has always stood in solidarity with her sister nations, even at the risk of endangering her relationships with other countries. And they've done so out of principle, and we salute them for their acts of solidarity. Right? That, that deserves an applause. The ambassador illustrated this recently at the UN when she delivered a powerful statement in defense of Venezuela and a rebuke of the international assault on the legitimate government of Venezuela and President Nicolas Maduro. We also know the work of defending Cuba takes a village. So I just want to take a moment to say that those of us in the Cuba Solidarity Movement, particularly those of us who live in the New York area, have had the great fortune of witnessing the incredible work of the Cuban delegation to the United Nations and the staff of the Cuban mission to the UN. Under the astute leadership and guidance of Ambassador Rodriguez at one of the most contentious moments in U.S.-Cuba relations, it has been an honor for the U.S.-Cuba solidarity community to collaborate with her and her team. But tonight we're here on the occasion of the 60th anniversary of the Cuban Revolution to pay tribute to our guest, who we also proudly claim as our ambassador. You can't get away from us. Right? Dear Ambassador, we gather this evening not to say goodbye but to say farewell and to tell you that we look forward to seeing the great things that you will undoubtedly do in your new post as Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs. Friends, please join me in expressing our love and appreciation for the Honorable Ambassador Aniance Rodriguez Camillo. of the movie said I, I said Gail that now I feel warm not because of the weather that is uh, well has improved a little bit uh, these days but uh, certainly it's not for the for the weather but because of your presence and you are uh, warming welcoming and, and you are very positive energies which is the this evening energies but the energy that you have had for decades together with us hand to hand with us defending the Cuban Revolution. And thank you very much for this welcoming. Thanks very much to the People's Forum for having us here and for the warming welcoming in your place, which is, of course, our place. We feel it like, like that. Then my, my heart is accelerated. Dear friends, sisters, and brothers of the Solidarity Movement, with Cuba in the, in the United States, insert here. You were just mentioning some of them very recently once. And I think particularly proudly of the recent battles in which you joined us. Last October, publicly supporting the Cuban Revolution during the vote of, on our resolution against the blockade. We were inside the UN but you were there on the front line, in the streets, on October 31st and November 1st, when we delivered 10 resounding blows to the enemy at the United Nations. You. And you again express your solidarity with the Cuban and Bolivarian revolutions in the face of the failed attempt, failed attempt 
to condemn Venezuela in the Security Council on January 26. <laughs> we would like you to know that we greatly admire the courage you have shown because we are aware, we are fully aware, the environment is very hostile. And precautions, of course, were needed because the enemies of the revolution, those who support the blockade, who do not want a normal and civilized relationship between our countries, were taking some action and, ag and are taking some action. Even in this city, in New York City, Logically, we were concerned because it is known that these people do not want peace. These people have been and continue to be supported by confessed terrorists who have plunged our homeland into mourning more than once. These people encourage confrontation and hostility as they made their living from it for a long time. They have filled their pockets with money stained with the blood of good Cubans. And we, of course, were worried. But right away we said, our friends in the United States are people with great dignity and ethics. They will never encourage confrontation. We also said, our friends know what the sense of duty is. Our friends have stood by our side even under most difficult circumstances. And if the time comes to raise the sword again and set off to fight, they will also be with us. We have no doubt on that. And we know this because the dignified people of the United States whom you represent have always been on the side of Cuba's independence defending our right to be free and to live in peace. And you have done so not only over the last 60 years, but since the very beginning of this revolution, which is the same and only revolution since 150 years ago. This revolution, this revolution that you are supporting today is the revolution of Céspedes, and Agramonte, of Maceo and Martí. It is the same revolution in which John American Henry Reeve, born precisely in this city, in Brooklyn, was known for his courage and as a combatant and chief of the Liberation Army, of the Cuban Liberation Army. It is the same revolution that hundreds of humble citizens of New York support and helped to pay for, along with the tobacco workers in Tampa and Key West, summoned su su by Marti. It is the same revolution that raised again the centenary generation led by Fidel, our historical leader, the historical leader of the revolution, and which many sons of this city supported by giving everything, even and in not a few cases, to their last penny. They are where the American friends helping also at that time the Cuban Revolution. With that historical legacy, we have come to this day. And we are proud to say that from those glorious days of the beginning of our independent struggles up to now, we have always had the solidarity, support, and selfless contribu contribution of all of you, the sons of the best and most noble of the American people. We are proud to say that you, the members of all generation of the movement of solidarity with Cuba in the United States, are also the Cuban Revolution. You are also the Cuban Revolution. Those who contribute to shaping the July 26 movement in the early 1950s, those who accompanied and supported from here the struggle in the Sierra Maestra mountains, those who welcomed Fidel in the Hotel Teresa in Harlem, <laughs> those 
the courageous, the courageous forerunners of the Antonio Maceo and Ben Seremos brigades. Those who did not hesitate to put their own lives at risk in order to break the blockade in the caravans of Pastor for Peace. Those who accompanied the battles for the return of Elian and the five Cuban heroes, anti-terrorist heroes to their homeland. And those who, who over these years, including the young people who are joining us today, have support the fight against the criminal blockade imposed on Cuba. In all of them and in all of you, like the spirit of the revolution and the spirit of the commander in chief, Fidel Castro Ruz. Viva. Así es. As you are, as you are all aware, today we continue the battle. We have to, under adverse circumstances, with the empire acting with more hostility and arrogance, seeking to harden the blockade and resuming the confrontation discourse, not only against Cuba, you have said it, but also with particularly fury against the sister Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela and against the right of the people of Latin America and the Caribbean to remain free, independent, and sovereign. Then we have, we, have a lot, we have a lot of pending issues. Continuous defending the Bolivarian Revolution in Venezuela. We have a still pending the independence of the sister island of Puerto Rico. Then we have to continue fighting for that. We have to continue fighting with our brothers and sisters from Palestine for them to have an independent state of Palestine. So the battle is not over. For revolutionaries and revolutions like ours, there will be no easy situations. And in this adverse context that we are facing, it is crucial to always keep in mind one of the greatest lessons that Commander-in-Chief Fidel has left to us, which is our permanent, our permanent revolutionary intransigence and faith in victory. <laughs> with, that, with that same faith in victory, we will win again next February 24th which will be remembered as an historic date when Cuba peop Cuban people, in a very transparent and democratic, transparent and democratic process, referendum adopted its new constitution, which endorsed the socialist character of our revolution. We can tell you, out of profound conviction, that we will not give, give in to the enemy. We will never allow concessions that will harm the sovereignty and independence of our homeland. We will never negotiate our principles or accept conditions of any kind, as we have never done in the history of the revolution. But both you and we can feel profound satisfaction in paying tribute to those who forged the nation we have today by reaffirming the determination to continue to defend and, straight, and straighten this victorious revolution, willing to give our all. Let us resolve to face this new challenge imposed upon us by history, guided by the example left to us by Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, Carlos Muñiz Varela, Lucius Walker, the eternal commander Hugo Chavez Frias, and our Fidel. We, we owe them, and we owe you the duty, the responsibility to never give, give up in the struggle, to continue fighting for a better homeland and for a better world. 
which was the ultimate dream of the founding fathers of our independence. Long live our socialist and democratic revolution of the humble, by the humble and for the humble. Viva nuestra revolución socialista y democrática, de los humildes, por los humildes y para los humildes. Long live our own defeat and ever present commander in chief Fidel. Viva nuestro invicto y siempre presente comandante en jefe Fidel. Viva. Long live the Bolivarian Revolution of Venezuela. Viva. Long live the friendship between our peoples. Viva la amistad entre nuestros pueblos. Viva. Socialismo o muerte. Viva. Patria o muerte. Viva. Thank you very much. Stay up again. Give you a few Gail, thank you so much for that really inspiring presentation. You can, we're really going to miss you. <laughs> I will miss you, Bef but you have me there. That's Before right. you go, we want to give you a couple of gifts. Um, where's the? Do you have the flowers, Rachel? Rachel, first of all, some flowers. Thank you, Rachel Barr. Thank you. Gracias. We would also like, uh, and this has been signed by a lot of organizations, wow. this is a wonderful book which everybody here should read. In fact, if you haven't read this book, you should stop whatever you're doing and get this book and read it right now. This is a wonderful account of the liberation struggle in Southern Africa and the decisive role that Cuba played. So this is from the Solidarity Movement in New York and New Jersey. Thank you, Thank you very much. Okay. And we have um, a card, <laughs> a homemade card. <laughs> and anybody who hasn't signed this, you still have time. Please, but please do it. It's to uh, express our love and appreciation. That's the you. most touching gift yeah, that yeah. I will bring That's with wonderful. me. Good. I mean, including those that I have received from uh, yeah, others. Right, right. <laughs> this is the most special. Excellent. <laughs> and this is a very small token. Wow. Um, uh, it's a, a, a way to remember uh, this historic uh, moment when our president, our president, you see how we claim, we're claiming everyone. <laughs> you see what we have to deal with, we're working with. We've got to claim our, our Cuban friends. But uh, photos of um, um, President uh, Diaz Canel and uh, Raul. Uh, as well as some of the pictures from the uh, the, the moment, uh, the evening great. at Riverside Church. That was really a great evening yeah, with thousands of people. Yes, there. yes. Yeah. We have another gift from Brother Shep of the Universal Zulu Nation. Um, this is a calendar written by a famous artist from Harlem. Um, people might know him as Sir Shadow. And um, he's well known, um, and um, just, just some great artwork here. He's known for Thank his stick you. figures and so forth. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> he's got some real good thoughts inside. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, please sign the uh, whatever color that is card that's going around. And there it is. We'll pass that around, and people can sign it. And, uh, yes. okay, now uh, we're gonna, entering into the last phase of the program here. We're going to have a little couple of demonstrations. Then we're going to clear this area here. We're going to put out the food. We've got a lot of wonderful food tonight, Cuban and I would say probably Southern African American. So it would be a good combination. And uh, we'll be getting to that soon. So uh, go ahead, Chef. Peace, everyone. Peace. <laughs> um, we have a sister comrade that recently passed away in Cuba, uh, Nyanda Abiodun. And, um, you know, we love the sister. She's a freedom fighter. And she was granted exile in Cuba for a lot of years, and she just passed away. So I'm going to ask two people that knew Nyanda 
to just say a couple of words. And so you know, her memorial is going to be next Saturday at the National Black Theater at 12 noon. You'll be getting the emails about it. But everybody's here, so I'm letting you know ahead of time that um, trees come out and support this freedom fighter um, who was forced into exile. And by the graciousness of the Cuban people, she was able to um, be in exile and be safe until she recently passed away. So I'm going to introduce um, Sister Joan Gibb, who's a well-known um, activist attorney. I think she's retired now, sort of. <laughs> and Sister Sharon Schultz. Um, whose father is still in prison. He's a political prisoner, Russell Maroon Schultz. And so um, they both experienced some time in the audience. So they're going to say a couple of words just in memorial for her. Thank you. Hi. I want to say before we begin that we're here in place and in, in part Seiko Odinga, who was supposed to be here. Um, I guess Nahanda is not as well known as our other sister in exile in Cuba. But I, so I wanted to let Asan, uh, Nahanda speak for herself. Before Nahanda went into exile, she was very active in the community, particularly in Harlem. Um, I remember being in a meeting with her. We were together at the founding convention of the National Black United Front, which is, I can't even remember when that was, but that was, that was a long time ago. Can people remember the National Black United Front? Okay. It was formed in Brooklyn. At a, at the first convention was at an armory. All right, I don't know. <laughs> okay. But what I wanted to do was give a, just quote, um, Nahanda was very active in the Malcolm X grassroots movement. And when she died, they issued a tribute to her acknowledging her passing. And within that, they included a lot of her writings. And I always think it's best that exiles and political prisoners speak for themselves, that you hear their words instead of mine. So that's what I want to do. I just want to end with the quote from Nahanda. I don't usually read from my phone, but that's just the only place I have it. <laughs> okay. And this is from, it's uh, subtitled, The Role of the Intellectual in Liberation. I see no difference in the role or responsibility of an intellectual than I do a day laborer when it's a question of freedom. Everyone has some sort of talent or intellect that would be of value to our liberation. It's a question of finding out what talent we have to offer and give it unselfishly to our struggle for self-determination. Is the intellectual any more important than the person who organizes the people to understand the theories of the intellectual or the person who defends the protests and rallies? Or for that matter, the person who does childcare so the parents can attend the demonstration? Was it not the house servant they secured information about the master's movement and plans that enabled very slave rebellions to be of some success. If we look at Cuba as an example, we will see that their triumph was in part due to the fact that the women and men from all sexes of society made contributions to defeat Batista. And no one has been excluded, regardless of education, race, or gender from defending the revolution. Thank you. I just want to share a um, personal story. I had the opportunity to visit Cuba in 2000, and the Honda was our host during that 10-day excursion um, with Black August, um, the Malcolm X Grassroots Movement, the hip-hop concert, um, Cuban hip-hop artists, American hip-hop um, hip -hop artists coming together. Um, in the spirit of revolution in Cuba. I had the opportunity to take my nine-year-old nephew who is now 29. And when we were there, of course we, you know, were in awe by the cars from 1960 that were still on the road. 
and the, you know, the resilience of the Cuban people. And we happened to go to the Matanza Museum and a bus broke down. <laughs> and the Honda said, it's gonna be four hours before we get another bus. So we all look like, really? <laughs> you know, and as Americans, we just, you know, like it's hot, what are we gonna do? You know, Nahanda got off the bus, she came back 15 minutes later, and she said, let's get off. So we all like, okay, where are we going? Next thing we knew, we were in a province of Cuban people who had opened up their homes, brought the tables out, the food, the music, it was like a block party. <laughs> and you know, we were like, wow, you know. But it showed the resilience of not only Nahanda, but the people of Cuba who welcomed us for four hours, nonetheless. And then my nephew, who was nine, and you know, I was a little worried, you know, because we didn't speak the language, he didn't speak the language. And he had a little handheld Game Boy. And of course, the kids just all came around him. And it was like, without the language, they knew instinctively as kids how to work together and come together. So I just wanted to share that piece of story with you because Nahanda was our black warrior queen Shiro. You know, although in exile, she brought together the Cuban hip hop artists. She made sure Black August was relevant. My nine year old nephew, who's now 29, is conscious about what took place for this anniversary. So I am I was taken back by the fact that she had passed away, you know, and I rarely get up and speak. So Shep was like, you got to come out and say something. So I'm happy that I'm here to share that story with you. And all I can say is that I'm proud to have been able to visit the land and rest in peace, Nahanda. Thank you, sister. Let's have a moment of silence for Nahanda. And we, ch we all cherish her memory. Okay, we're almost going to break for food. We got one last. Nahanda Presente. Nahanda Presente. I'd like to call up, uh, again, Brother Shep from the Universal Zulu Nation, who's going to give a uh, tribute to the people that help us organize security at all these events. Um, first, I have to say thank you to the organizers. Um, it's very rare that security ever gets a knowledge for anything. <laughs> okay. Although we still committed to protecting the people and doing what needs to be done, and that evening at Riverside was extremely important to make sure that both presidents were protected in general, but in particular that the people were protected. And um, I want to thank them all for doing that. Uh, we were going to do a, a presentation, but what I'm going to do instead is um, we're going to do a short um, demonstration. Um, just so folks know that it's not just people just standing around trying to look tough, okay? Um, our, our squad is pretty trained. They're bonded, insured, um, some are licensed to carry, and we're just going to do a quick uh, martial arts demonstration for folks, all right? And um, so I'm going to call up a couple of our Zulu kings, and um, unfortunately, we couldn't have everyone that was on security here tonight because uh, we got some of them in the Philippines right now, we got folks in Indianapolis, folks in DC, folks in California, folks in Japan. Um, we do work all over this planet, okay? So when you see us, you're getting professional security to protect you. Just wanted to put that out there. So I'm gonna call up Zulu King Scott um, and a couple of um, comrades here, just do a quick demonstration. And um, there's flyers that we have, um, King Tafik, um, he's supposed to be en route from Florida, but his plane was delayed. <laughs> but um, he's sponsoring a martial arts demonstration on the 24th. And so get a flyer, go to Harlem, okay? Go to Harlem, don't be afraid, <laughs> all right? 
and you get there, you'll be protected anyway. But uh, it's the Comedic Ma uh, Masters of the Martial Arts, the 17th year where we have masters that come together, and it's good for children and so forth, and whole family. So come out for that. Be sure you pick up a flyer. That was Scott. Before I leave, um, everyone here that works security that evening, could you all please stand up? Chino Familia. That's my first original family I was with, my local family, before I started running the security for Zulu Nation. He got me politically involved with everybody. His family is original young lords. So every rally, every march, he's the first to bring me to. Yeah. yeah. There's, there's, there's 29 people who are not here getting to do another assignment, so. It is so beautiful to be here and to see this energy. You know, like they, I just can't believe it. You know, it just adds 
Well, I'm 39 years old <laughs> now. <laughs> and I feel even bitter. You cannot believe how good this feels. Uh, I want you to protect each other and love each other. And um, I hope to be back here for my 40th birthday. <laughs> Um, there are people here that are young enough not to know anything about me. I was accused of um, trying to destroy the Statue of Liberty once upon a time uh, because somebody thought it was totally irrelevant that somebody blew up a church killing four little black girls from six to nine, and everybody, there are people in this world that thought it was fine. What's, what's, what's wrong with killing four little black girls? I was one of the people that thought there was something wrong with that. Uh, now, I realize this is simply thank you, and you have my, my love, 